Happy 2024, everyone. We're beginning a new year with many possibilities ahead of us, a new start, fresh chances, and even a new Alien movie set to premiere this summer. But for today's video, I'd like to take a trip into the past, into the year 1989, specifically in the earlier months of the year, in March. Just picture it. Debbie Gibson's Lost in Your Eyes was at the top of the Billboard 100 charts. Time Incorporated and Warner Brothers Pictures have just merged, creating Time Warner Cable. The 61st Academy Awards were just weeks away, and Sigourney Weaver would be present for the big event, having been nominated in two categories. Best Actress in a Leading Role for Gorillas in the Mist, and Best Supporting Actress for her role in Working Girl. This was a pretty big deal. This was only the third time in the now near century-long tradition of the Academy Awards that an actress had been nominated twice the same year for two separate roles. The CBS television network seemingly decided to celebrate this milestone by airing the film for which Weaver had previously been nominated, Aliens. On Tuesday, March 14th, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, James Cameron's Aliens made its network television premiere. Here's a look at the promo for the night's broadcast. Tonight, a CBS special movie. This year, she's the only actress nominated for two Academy Awards. Riveting in a role that dominates the screen. Each one of these things comes from an egg. So who's laying these eggs? Sigourney Weaver stars in a network premiere that will push you to the outer edge. A film that will make you glad. Get away from her, you... She's one of us. Aliens. Next. Now, what the promos don't tell you, and what makes this television version of Aliens so significant, is that this would be the first time deleted footage from the film would be publicly available for audiences. The special edition version wasn't released yet, and James Cameron had been hinting as early as 1987 in an interview with Starlog magazine that he wanted to edit additional scenes into a TV version of the film as a way to sort of test the waters. It was not an unusual thing at the time for television broadcasts to incorporate previously unseen footage mostly as a way to adjust the film's overall runtime and accommodate for commercial breaks. The broadcast of Aliens had a three-hour runtime that night, with a total of ten commercial breaks. The original cut of Aliens is two hours and seventeen minutes to begin with, so a three-hour television event seemed ideal. But even by today's standards, if you're still even watching broadcast TV, 43 minutes of commercials in total is kind of pushing it. So that's where the extra footage comes in but it's not everything that would eventually make its way to the special edition. Most notably, there are no scenes of the colony before the infestation. Those are still absent. But scenes such as Ripley discovering the fate of her daughter, the footage involving the sentry guns, and Ripley exchanging first names with Hicks are seen for the very first time here. Consider it Aliens Special Edition in Utero, or a third alternate version of the film Lost to Time. Excluding the commercial breaks and taking into account some slight cuts here and there, as well as sped up credits, the TV version runs at approximately 2 hours and 25 minutes. A good 8 minutes longer than the theatrical version. Not quite as substantial as the nearly 20 minutes added in the special editions, but still a respectable extension. And still good enough of a reason to watch the broadcast if you had already seen Aliens in theaters, or on VHS tape, or on HBO. This additional footage was exclusive to this CBS airing. No one had ever seen it before, so it was a pretty cool distinction for the TV version to have at the time. But of course, you did have to deal with the commercials, and perhaps even worse, the censorship. Aliens is an R-rated movie. There's violence and coarse language. Not everything is going to make it to primetime network television. The dialogue of Aliens was edited quite a bit, with some dubbing to replace certain swear words and some awkward cutarounds to soften the language overall. I don't know about you, but this is actually one of my favorite things about TV versions of movies from this era. It really amuses me. So let's take a look at some of the censorship of Aliens from the TV version and compare it to the original film. Because if one of those things gets down here, then that will be all. Then all this, this bullshit that you think is so important, you can just kiss all that goodbye. 
Because if one of those things gets down here, then that will be all. Then all this, this gold that you think is so important, you can just kiss all that goodbye. She's supposed to be some kind of consultant. Apparently, she saw an alien once. <laughs> Whoopie fucking do. <laughs> She's supposed to be some kind of consultant. Apparently, she saw an alien once. <laughs> Whoopie do. <laughs> what is it, Private? How do I get out of this chicken shit outfit? You secure that shit, Hudson. What is it, Private? How do I get out of this outfit? Secure that, Hudson. All right, sweethearts, you heard the man and you know the drill. Assholes and elbows. Hudson, come here. Come here. All right, sweethearts, you heard the man and you know the drill. Nothing. Not a goddamn thing. Nothing. Not a damn thing. It's coming in. I feel safer already. He's coming in. I feel safer already. Fuck. Hold up. Ripley. Great. Ripley. We can't have any firing in there. I, uh, I want you to collect magazines from everybody. Is he fucking crazy? We can't have any firing in there. I, uh, I want you to collect magazines from everybody. Is he crazy? He's coming out of the goddamn wall, fuck! He's coming out of the damn wall, fuck! He's coming out of the goddamn wall! God, where's the phone? Where's the phone? Sergeant's gone! Get the fuck out of here! Signs were real low, but they ain't dead. Then we go back in there and get them. Fuck that. We don't leave our people behind. I ain't going back in there. You can't help lady. them. The signs were real low, but they ain't dead. Then we go back in there and get them. We don't leave our people behind. I ain't going back in there. You can't help lady. them. All right. We got seven canisters of CN20. I said we roll them in there and nerve gas the whole fucking nest. All right. We got seven canisters of CN20. I said we roll them in there and nerve gas the whole nest. Hey, maybe you haven't been keeping up on current events, but we just got our asses kicked, pal. Hey, maybe you haven't been keeping up on current events, but we just got our butts kicked, pal. Spuckmeyer. God damn it. Well, where the fuck? Spuckmeyer. Damn it. Well, where the? Well, that's great. That's just fucking great, man. Now what the fuck are we supposed to do? We're some real pretty shit now, man. You finished. Well, that's great. That's just freaking great, man. Now what the hell are we supposed to do? We're some real pretty stuff now, man. You finished. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do? That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. What are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do? Maybe we could build a fire, sing a couple of songs, huh? We got problems. I don't believe this. I don't fucking believe this. Fast gas, close the shadows. We got problems. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. Fast gas, close the shadows. Well, I don't care how, but we better think of something. We better think of a way. Think of what? We're fucked. Shut up. We're doomed, Shut up. up. Well, I don't care how, but we better think of something. We better think of a way. Think of what? Shut up! Do this! Shut up! No! Christ, Jim, look out! Please, Jim, look out! Then he could jettison the bodies and make up any story he might. Fuck! He's dead. You're dog meat, pal. Then he could jettison the bodies and make up any story he liked. What? He's dead. You're dog me, pal. 13 meters. That's right outside the door. Hicks, Vasquez, get back. Man, this is a big fucking signal. 13 meters. 
your team That's is. right outside the door. Hicks, Vasquez, get back. Man, this is a big freaking signal. <laughs> from her, you bitch! Get away from her, you bitch! Yes, they kept the famous line. Thank God for small favors. I'm not exactly an expert on television censorship, but at that point in the broadcast, it was nearing 11 p.m., so surely they could at least say the word bitch. These are the more memorable edits from the TV version. There are other instances where they simply just cut out portions of dialogue entirely. Take, for example, this dialogue regarding the sentry guns. We got four of these robot sentries with display and scanners intact. They really kick ass. I think they come in handy. We got four of these robot sentries with display and scanners intact. I think they come in handy. So there's a fair deal of that in this version, and maybe not as much dubbing as compared to some other TV edits. But it does remain a pretty standard process in the post-production phase of a movie for actors to come in and redub their lines for additional dialogue recording due to any kind of onset noise or just general consistent clarity on the audio track. At the time, it also wasn't unusual during this process for actors to record alternate dialogue for versions meant to air on television and as in-flight entertainment. It seems to me that the only cast member who actually recorded alternate dialogue was Bill Paxton, which makes good enough sense since it's the Hudson character who does the most cussing throughout the movie. I have no idea who's dubbing over Drake, screaming out, Great! But it sure doesn't sound like Mark Ralston. But I could be wrong. Mark, if you're watching, I'd love some clarification on this. But it's definitely the language that suffers the most censorship in this version. Surprisingly, the violence stays intact, mostly. Aliens was never an especially gory movie to begin with, though it did have its bloody moments. The scene with the chestburster coming out of the colonist in the hive certainly comes to mind. The television version does indeed censor it, but actually not too harshly. It's almost shot for shot the same as the original version, with the alien ripping its way through the colonist's chest and Ripley looking on in horror, Save for one instance where we see the full view of the emerging chestburster and the dead colonist. Again, I'm no censorship expert, but maybe the scene gets the leeway that it does because the chestburster shots are just so close up. So it doesn't give the entire gruesome view, so when that does happen, it's removed. Another somewhat gory moment is when Pharaoh is attacked by an alien on the dropship and blood splatters all over the window. That remains as is. The Queen's attack on Bishop is pretty gruesome, but I guess since he's a robot and it's white blood, not red, that's acceptable enough according to the censors, and that is also unedited. All things considered, it's not bad for a TV cut of the film. I can't really say it's a complete butchering, not by a long shot, but obviously it's irking to have it censored for some of the violent content in its language. But it's pretty standard for the time, and at least for the time, the additional footage was a fair enough trade-off. And that's pretty much the overview of the 1989 broadcast, just about all you need to know about what was added to the film and what was taken away. But maybe you're like me and you have an interest in this thing as almost like a time capsule. Little details, what station did it air on, what commercials were played. 
When exactly were the commercial breaks? Things like that. Well, maybe you're willing to dive just a little bit deeper with me as we continue. My copy of the broadcast is on an honest-to-goodness VHS tape. Surely not the original recording, and based on the quality, it's at least got to be a third-generation copy of a copy. It's presented and referenced for you here today through the power of Elgato. This particular recording was taped off of a broadcast from the station KOIN, COIN, Channel 6, CBS affiliate based in Oregon. So, shout out to Oregon, and shout out to COIN, which is still broadcasting to this day. Throughout the three-hour broadcast, the station's on-screen ID appears intermittently, and there are portions between the commercial blocks devoted to local news bumpers. Other than that, though, it's safe to assume, with maybe a few exceptions state per state, the majority of the commercials aired on this station also aired on all other CBS affiliates nationally that night. With that in mind, let's hop into it. It's Tuesday night, 1989, March 14th, 8 p.m. You've just popped a bag of Orville Redenbacher, the families in the living room gathered around the massive 27-inch CRT TV, and CBS is about to start its special movie. The promo has played, and a special message from tonight's sponsor, Sears, plays, and we get an ad with a familiar celebrity voiceover. Why wait for sales? Sears now has great low prices every single day. Comment below if you recognize that voice. There's also some brief ads for Xlax and Vision's Cookware, and the movie begins. It is now 8.02 p.m. With ten commercial breaks in total, the movie is divided around the three-hour runtime fairly enough, with each segment lasting somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes. So even if you had seen the movie before and just thought to yourself, ah, I'll just watch a little bit, the first glimpse of the new footage occurs before the first commercial break. That is, of course, Ripley receiving the news of her daughter's death during the 57 years taking place between films. The segment reaches its end after the inquiry scene where Ripley learns that there are now families of colonists living on LV-426. We have arrived at the first commercial break. There's commercials for Advil, or McDonald's, specifically McDonald's breakfast, maybe because eggs fit with the theme of tonight's program. I do love those Egg McMuffins. Monty Hall of Let's Make a Deal fame stars in an Oldsmobile commercial, Florida Orange Juice, a special message from America's Dairy Farmers about butter and how it's really not as worse compared to margarine as you may think, and there's a final spot, Stop the Madness, a CBS public awareness message, an anti-drug ad starring Kojak's Kevin Dobson. Hey, don't you owe it to yourself and your family to say no to drugs? Go ahead, say it. Say no drugs. All right, way to go. The movie continues, not via the special edition route, but by the theatrical versions, so there is unfortunately no glimpse of the Hadley Soap Colony in this television presentation. This segment of the film contains one of the more significant cuts censorship-wise, removing several seconds of the film, actually. After Ripley calls Burke and agrees to join the Marines on the mission to LV-426, there's a memorable moment of levity where Ripley turns to Jones, saying, And you, you little shithead. You're staying here. That moment is missing from the TV version. No editing of the dialogue, no awkward dub over it. They just removed it and cut directly to the next scene. I was going to say that it was odd then that they'd allow Apone giving Hudson the middle finger in the following scene, but I guess technically because of the way he's holding the cigar, it's actually not really the middle finger, I guess. At least, you could argue that to the censors, and maybe someone did, and won. But just a few minutes later, Vasquez unmistakably flips the bird to Hudson, but that happens to be also while she's saying, fuck you, man, so very naturally, that's all cut out. Right, right. Somebody said alien. She thought they said illegal alien and signed up. Are you finished? This segment ends with Ripley operating the power loader, much to the amusement of Hicks and Apone. The two have a laugh, and we cut to commercial. Coors Extra Gold, Amore Cat Food, Mazda Trucks rated the most reliable truck sold in America, Burger King advertising their Cheeseburger Deluxe, Sinutab, and a bumper letting you know we'll be back to the movie soon. There's an advertisement for the World Figure Skating Championships being held in Paris that year. 
CBS had the broadcasting rights for that, and also a special 50th anniversary presentation of The Wizard of Oz, airing the upcoming Sunday after 60 minutes. Also an ad for the series premiere of a sitcom titled Heartland. The Ford F-Series, the best-selling truck in the Northwest. First Interstate Bank. And a local news preview before the movie returns. Chilean fruit spoiling in warehouses. Critics say it's an overreaction. At 11. Now we turn to Sigourney Weaver and Paul Reiser in Aliens. The movie continues. It is now 8.38 p.m. That previous block of commercials may have actually been the longest of the entire broadcast, lasting nearly four minutes. That may seem par for the course today, but that's a pretty big chunk of commercials for network TV in the late 80s. So maybe you're watching and itching to get back to the movie, and you decide to flip around the channels a little bit. Through the magic of archives, we know what else was on TV. Here's what you may have seen airing that night. At this exact time, The Wonder Years would have been playing on ABC. But during the evening, they also aired brand new episodes of Roseanne, Anything But Love, and 30-something. The Tony Danza sitcom, Who's the Boss, also aired earlier that night, but it was a repeat. Okie dokie, Angelina. <laughs> We're all set. You see, I got, I got aliens. I got city slickers, and I got the way we were. What do you want to do? Scream, laugh, or cry? Over on NBC, a rerun of Matlock was playing, followed by a new episode of In the Heat of the Night. Not a bad night of programming. These are the three big networks, at least. I couldn't find archives beyond that, but it gives you a good enough idea. But back to Aliens, as the dropship approaches, we get our first on-screen station ID at 8.45 p.m. This segment ends when Lieutenant Gorman informs the squads that he's coming in. Vasquez mutters that he's a pendejo, censored from Pendejo Jerkoff in the original film, and we cut to commercial. There's ads for speed stick deodorant, Correctol, a fiber laxative that's strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. Another quick Sears ad, Burger King's Cheeseburger Deluxe, a MetLife ad starring the Peanuts Gang, more upcoming CBS programming, including a show called Hard Time on Planet Earth, with Dallas, Falcon Crest, the Cattle Company advertising their sirloin and lobster dinner for $9.95. Wow. A New Zealand tourism spot, and some more local news. Assault rifles banned from the U.S. You'll hear local reaction at 11. We now return to Sigourney Weaver in the CBS special movie presentation, Aliens. During this segment of the film, we reach the one-hour mark in the broadcast. Just as Newt is discovered, the clock reaches 9 p.m. One thing about Aliens is that it gets a lot of praise for its build-up. It's not really the kind of approach to an action, horror, thriller movie that you'd see today. It allows a good deal of time to let the tension rise, and many would agree that it really pays off once the horror unfolds, and it never really lets you go after that. But there are people who criticize that aspect of it as well. Some would say it's a little too long of a wait before the conflict arises. And while I don't necessarily agree with that, I can at least appreciate where someone may be coming from. So that makes me all the more curious about how someone watching this broadcast, seeing this movie for the first time that night, may have felt. Because now, on top of the slow burn of the movie itself, we also have all these commercials. Just to compare the experience, at the hour mark in the commercial-free theatrical version of the film, we would be right at the moment before the aliens start coming out of the walls and attacking. It's the crucial part of the film where the thrills amp up immensely. With the TV version, that's still a good 15 minutes away. So I do kind of wonder if some viewers maybe lost patience and turned over to another network, only to miss out on the full experience of the greatest movie ever. I wonder about that. And the website that has archived the television schedule of that night also happens to include the Nielsen ratings. Now, I've never really fully understood exactly how Nielsen ratings work and can't really vouch for their accuracy. In fact, nobody really can except for maybe Rain Man. But this was the standard for the time to best track how many people were tuned into network TV shows at any given night. I'm sure you can find way better explanations, but the most concise way of putting it is that the Nielsen Company would sample a certain number of chosen households, track their viewing habits, and determine the overall ratings based on that sampled data. A Nielsen rating would roughly translate to a percentage of all the Nielsen viewers all over the United States and then estimated to television viewers overall. 
To give you an idea of the average Nielsen ratings of the most popular programs at the time, we have a pretty definitive chart on Wikipedia for the year 1989. The Cosby Show and Roseanne were tied for the highest ratings overall, scoring a 23.1 Nielsen rating each, with Cheers not too far behind tracking a rating of 22.7. These are considered excellent ratings, of course, but if we want to compare to the phenomenal, groundbreaking, unheard of Nielsen ratings, then we can look at the finale of M.A.S.H. The last episode of the Korean War-centered comedy starring Alan Alda is often cited as one of the biggest pop culture moments of all time. That broadcast, which aired in February of 1983, had a Nielsen rating of 60.2, translating to an estimated 125 million viewers. That's up there with the moon landing, the police pursuit of O.J. Simpson, Richard Nixon's resignation, and any given Super Bowl. All this is to say that we have the astronomical numbers, we have the excellent top shows of the year numbers, and we have the reasonably good numbers. I'd say anything around a 10 is reasonably good. Aliens had a Nielsen rating of 11.3, which is still in the tens of millions watching that night, certainly nothing to scoff at. I mean, you could look at these other ratings that night and say, hey, all these other shows did better. Even reruns of Who's the Boss and Matlock had higher numbers, but this is an average of a much longer broadcast. All these viewers watched over a three-hour period on average, and it almost goes without saying that a half-hour or even hour-long program is going to show these better numbers. Also taking into account that this is a movie that had already been out for some time, and even being edited for content, this just isn't something that all families are going to get together and watch. It's just not. So the fact that it even remained competitive is a triumph. But back to the movie. This segment ends with Newt ominously telling Ripley that even with the soldiers here to protect them, it won't make any difference, and we cut to commercial. The same Sears commercial that appeared at the beginning of the broadcast is shown again. There's a Pond soap commercial, DuPont's Stain Master, and another rocking commercial for Coors Extra Gold. Let's take a look at this one. If you think you can handle the big, bold taste of Extra Gold Draft, Hang on. This is the full tilt draft real beer drinkers have been thirsty for. And it looks like they aren't going to let go. Grab hold of an extra gold. It's the biggest taste that's happened to beer since they put it in cans. They really don't make beer commercials like that anymore, do they? But we're back to the movie. Bishop is examining the facehugger, and Hudson is tracking down the colonists' personal data transmitters. This is an example of another cut for censorship's sake. Hicks's line... Looks like a goddamn town meeting. ...is removed entirely. The Marines enter the hive, and arguably the most chilling and unnerving moment of the movie unfolds. The colonists are found, all dead, cocooned in a mysterious alien substance, frozen in expressions of terror. I don't know about you, but I think this is the perfect time to throw up the station ID. You're watching COIN, Channel 6. As previously mentioned, there's the chestburster scene, which is mildly censored, and everything else minus the language edits appears as it does in the original film. For all of the chaos unfolding, a lot of it is left to the audience's imagination. Nothing especially violent actually takes place on screen. Even something like Drake getting sprayed with acid blood and burned to death, which is a horribly violent concept, isn't exactly horribly violent in its execution. It gets the idea across, we see everything in very quick shots, and it is horrifying. But it's not explicit or overdone for gore's sake, so I guess it was fine to wear on TV because none of it is censored. After the escape from the hive, the survivors decide that the only way to be sure is to take off and nuke the entire site from orbit, and that's where the segment ends and we cut to the next commercial break. We have another commercial for Sears, Glass Plus Glass Cleaner, Mazda, Century 21 Real Estate, and another incredible beer commercial. It's the right beer for winter fun, silver blades, funky shades, and a downhill run. Come on in to Coors Light, the great life here for a good long time. So right beer now. There's an ad for Geraldo airing on Channel 6, Theraflu, Bernstein's Ranch Dressing, and Bernstein's Blue Cheese Dressing. This one's kind of interesting because it's like that thing everyone does with cake now, but with cheese. 
So there's really nothing new under the sun, is there? And now, a look at sports. Blazers, Warriors, and a burnt biscuit award at 11. We now return to the CBS special movie presentation of Aliens. It is now 9.30 p.m. We're officially halfway through the broadcast. Things go terribly wrong for our heroes, and the chances of leaving LV-426 have just become pretty slim. This famously upsets Hudson, and I think we should take another look at the censored rants, because they're just gold. Well, that's great! That's just freaking great, man! Now what the hell are we supposed to do? We're in some real pretty stuff now, man! You finished? That's it, man. Game over, man! Game over! What are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do? Maybe we could build a fire, sing a couple of songs, huh? And then the film reaches a point, exclusive to the broadcast, where we are first introduced to the sentry guns. This plot element will carry on through the next few scenes of the movie until finally the aliens find their way into the complex and into the operations center. It's been said before, but it's worth saying again, this never should have been cut out of the film in the first place. It helps the tension of this section of the film so much, and we're given a little bit of hope and that maybe the sentry guns will keep them safe, and that slowly dwindles each time we go back to them and the ammo runs out at each perimeter. You know what, it just plain makes sense as to why they were able to hold off the aliens as long as they did, because we get a good enough sense that barricades alone aren't enough. And for sure, it's also pretty fun to see a little extra moments here and there of aliens being blown to bits, even if some of the footage is unfortunately recycled. It is arguably the most significant change from the theatrical film, since it has such an impact on the entire context of this particular section of the film. And if you're watching on Tuesday, March 14th, 1989, this was the first time you or anybody else was seeing this included in a cut of Aliens. This segment of the broadcast ends with Ripley tucking Newt in for bed, and there is a pretty brief block of commercials. Sears, yet again. Alberto styling hairspray. Acura Integra. Delta Airlines. Coors Light, yet again. And we're back to the movie. Another on-screen station ID appears over Ripley as she views Gorman's unconscious body in the med lab, and the group discusses the alien life cycle. Although this TV version includes additional footage, the extended version of this conversation with specific mention of the Queen is not included here. Ripley joins Newt for a nap, and we have another commercial break. More of all the fabulous products you can buy at Sears, and interestingly, we have the first and only ad for a movie playing in theaters at the time. And fittingly enough, that movie happens to be Leviathan, a well-known alien ripoff. That was released on March 18th, 1989. There's another beer commercial, this time for Michelob Dry, American Express, and an ad for Maximum Strength Dristan, starring Mike Ditka. You think my guys are going to be sidelined by a tough sinus quote? Not these Grabowskis. The congestion, the pain, the sinus pressure. As tough as it gets, new Maximum Strength Dristan is tougher. Dristan unblocks congestion here. Sweeps away pressure here and here. Knocks out sinus pain. And it won't make you drowsy. That's important. When you're playing with bears, when you can't call in sick, call on Dristan. It's maximum strength relief. We will return to Sigourney Weaver and Paul Reiser in Aliens. There's a very cheesy ad for what was surely a very cheesy sitcom called Live In, set to premiere the next week. If you have no memory of this show, it's probably because it was cancelled after nine episodes. Another ad for Heartland, which is another short-lived sitcom advertised earlier during this broadcast. And there's a brief but informative presidential portrait on Chester A. Arthur, narrated by Dan Rather. I'm Dan Rather, CBS News. Less than a year after the nation lost one president to an assassin's bullet, his successor was diagnosed as terminally ill with kidney disease. While the new chief executive believed he'd never live out his term in office, he kept his illness a secret. If he told the truth, he reasoned, he would seriously impair his ability to govern. Often in great pain, he plunged headlong into the crusade for federal reform, which led to the establishment of the modern civil service. The president who served the nation on borrowed time was Chester Allen Hawk. There's a commercial for Windex, the Yellow Pages, NutraSweet, and another news bumper. A power shortage on the shuttle. Could bring it down early. At 11. 
We now return to Sigourney Weaver and Paul Reiser in Aliens. Bishop is working on aligning the colony satellite to bring down the second dropship by remote, and the incredibly tense facehugger scene unfolds. It is now a minute past 10 p.m. Here we enter the post-10 p.m. school night phenomenon that many children and parents have experienced during this era. An era that arguably lasted decades where broadcast TV and so-called primetime had this sick and twisted hold on our lives and even dictated our schedules. It was sort of the unwritten rule that 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. was the time for the whole family to gather around the TV. You'd watch the block of sitcoms like Who's the Boss, like The Cosby Show, Family Ties, what have you. But it was 10 p.m., usually, that was when the kids were supposed to go to bed. Usually 10 to 11 was an hour-long drama of some kind for the parents. Knott's Landing, L.A. Law, Miami Vice, again, any number of shows. Then the news. Then maybe a little bit of Carson, and eventually the whole nuclear family winds down and falls asleep. That's just kind of how it was. But every so often, you'd get the special movie presentation that would disrupt all that. If you see a movie is starting at 8 o'clock, you almost automatically assume that it's going to be a neat and tidy two hours, and be over by 10. Not every single mom and dad is going to check the TV listings and the broadcast duration beforehand, so they'll reach this dilemma. The family's still gathered around the TV, dad looks at his watch, hey wait a minute, it's past 10 now. This doesn't seem like it's going to be over anytime soon. And the kids, if they noticed, don't bring it up unless the parents do. But they're invested at this point. Come on, let us stay up and finish the movie. And if you were lucky, the exception was made. Just this once, you can stay up past your bedtime. You can watch the rest of the movie. I'm willing to bet that if you're a certain age, this has happened to you. I know it happened to me. Not with aliens, but I remember when I was five or six years old, I got to stay up until 10.30 p.m. when Jaws played on TV. And of course, I had the bragging rights the next day at school. This is indeed a very true phenomenon. You may remember there was even a gag about it on the quintessential nuclear family satire, The Simpsons. They're all watching a Bible movie, and it's starting to get late. The kids ask to keep watching, and good old Marge and Homer let them stay up. But the gag here is that the movie is so long that by the time it's over, the next thing playing is the morning news. So that's kind of the territory we've entered at this point in the broadcast. And everything from this point is just so intense that if you've come this far, there's no way you're going to want to miss the last hour. The newspaper ad for the airing was true. It was a movie to lose sleep over. In more than one ways, I suppose. Because I'm sure all the kids staying up watching ended up having nightmares, anyway. But here we are, Ripley and Newt are saved from the facehuggers. This, of course, was all the nefarious plan of Sigourney Weaver's co-star Paul Reiser, playing Burke. He is confronted by the group, and there's another unfortunate instance of censorship that I didn't mention earlier. This is one of the cases where a line is cut out rather than it be dubbed over or edited. Or maybe more accurately, it's half a line that's cut out. You know, Burke, I don't know which species is worse. All right, we waste him. No offense. No! He's gotta go back! Yes, Ripley's great line is trimmed here. You don't see them fucking each other over for a goddamn percentage is removed. I love that line, and unfortunately it is compromised by network TV. But we all know at this point how things play out. The power goes out, the aliens have infiltrated the complex, many lives are lost, and Newt ends up being captured by an alien and brought to the hive. Ripley, with an acid-burned Hicks, boards the dropship, as Ripley informs Bishop they're not leaving quite yet. Cut to commercial. It's 10.20 p.m. We have ads for Band-Aids, Act Fluoride Mouthwash, Tylenol Cold, the Jacqueline Smith Spring Collection at Kmart, Odor Eaters, and back to the movie. The dropship makes its way into the processing station, and here we get the final piece of additional TV footage. Ripley and Hicks exchange their first names. Ripley makes her way into the hive, saves Newt, and at exactly 10.30 p.m., we meet the alien queen. When they get away just as the processor explodes, we cut for another commercial break. Maybe at this point, some parents, or anyone up a little bit late past their bedtime, would say, good enough, and end it here, but there is more to go. This commercial break features an ad for Orville Redenbacher's Popcorn, Martha Stewart for Kmart, Sunlight Dish Detergent, MCI Telecommunications, another Orville Redenbacher spot, another spot for the failed sitcom Live In, a CBS News ad highlighting Dan Rather, and some more local news and ads before the return to the movie. 
This is CBS. Good evening. It's 45 degrees in Portland, 49 forecast tomorrow. Police tonight found a North Portland man shot to death in his home. A southeast woman finds a cougar on her roof and calls the dog catcher. And a San Diego company has bought its way into Portland's shipyard. Now this. Mama's to get my Candy snacks. Real craft, wholesome ingredients make an honest to goodness snack kids really love. Honest to goodness, wholesome and food. Craft and snacks. Honest to goodness. President Bush stops the importation of assault rifles. Concerned criminals might be buying them. A Junction City teen will be tried as a juvenile for five auto deaths. The trailblazers at home win big over Golden State. Join us at 11. I'm going home to Jenny O. Every day, all over America, people are coming home to Jenny O. Jenny O. Because only Jenny O knows the secrets to great tasting turkey. I'm going home to Jenny O. Jenny O knows. Make a break for the Pat Sajak Show, weeknights on Coin TV. Uh, the conclusion of Aliens, starring Sigourney Weaver. This final segment of the actual movie, not including the credits, is the shortest of the night, running at just under nine minutes before they squeeze in some room for more commercials. It's been a long night, a three-hour movie event filled with suspense and thrills, made even more agonizing by having to wait for what's going to happen next after each commercial break. But we finally made it. The Queen is on the Sulaco, Ripley is geared up in the power loader, and it's a fight to the death between warring mothers. Ripley wins the day, and finally she and Newt can settle in for a nice sleep in their cryotubes and hopefully have sweet dreams. Cut to commercial. Of course, being the sponsor in most repeated ads of the night is Sears. Your money's worth, and a whole lot more. Another ad for Century 21 Realty. Minute Maid Orange Juice. There's an interesting Vaseline commercial with some thermal Predator Vision type effects that make you wonder if that's next week's movie. And finally, MCI Telecommunications. The credits roll sped up, of course, and a quick word from Pat Sajak. Hi, I'm Pat Sajak. My talk show will warm the cockles of your heart later tonight. Although I don't really know what cockles are or why they should be warm, for that matter. Stay tuned for your local news next. And that's it. That's the Aliens 1989 TV broadcast on CBS. I hope you enjoyed taking the closer look at it with me, beyond the overview and censorship and all that. I just like to think about these things, seeing how it was presented at this specific point in history. I mean, of course, today it's all better and more convenient. If you want to watch Aliens, you can pull it up on streaming, anytime, anywhere. You don't have to wait for an airing or sit through commercials, unless you're watching it on Amazon Prime, of course. You mothers. But the point is, back then, it truly was an event. For sure, it released in theaters in 1986, then on home video, on cable, and had all these kinds of different lives and different releases. But this was like one final victory lap for the movie. A national, televised, exclusive broadcast on a major TV network for everyone across the country to see. I like to think about that, and who might have been watching. The families gathered around the TV, playing in the background of a bar or a restaurant. Even at the local television stations where Shirley was on the monitors somewhere before the local anchors went on for the news. Maybe even the cast members of the movie were at home just relaxing, flipping around the TV. Just like anybody else, and they flip to CBS and they're like, hey, that's me. That just tickles me. Television could reach people in a very different way than what was possible through theatrical exhibitions. You'd have everyone tuned in, watching exactly the same moments at exactly the same time. It could be a unifying experience. It was March 14th, 1989, the Night of Aliens. If you happen to be watching that night, I'd love to hear from you, so please leave a comment down below, or if in general your first time watching Aliens was on TV at some point. If you have an experience you'd like to share, I'd love to hear that. But this now concludes our broadcast day. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Be sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up with the latest videos, and even hit the notification bell if you're so inclined. 
My very special thanks today goes out to Brandon James, Zeno Shadowmorph, and Xenozip, Queen Tears of the Patreon Hive. Thank you to Gregory Ford and John Griggs, the Hive's Praetorians. A very special thanks to Lady Anne, the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence. And thank you so very much, Nicholas Butta and Frank, the Alien Theory Wayland yutani Executives. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for further information. In the meantime, you can follow me on social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on TikTok for some fun video extras. And follow at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.